Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask him that you will speak your word to us today again. And we pray that you will shed light on the reaching word so your spirit will apply it to our lives and grant us the enablement from above to be able to do as your word directs. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still studying the epistle to the Colossians and today we're looking at chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11. For this cause we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. We have considered verse 9 already, but then we cannot consider verses 10 and 11 without linking it up with verse 9. In the major purpose of the prayer of Paul the Apostle is that these believers and believers today will know the truth of the Word of God. After knowing the truth of the word of God, that our lives will be ordered thereby. See verse 10. So that ye might be work worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In verse 9 it says, His prayer, His desire for these believers is that they will be filled with the knowledge of His will. And I explained to you last week that to be filled with the knowledge of his will means to be so saturated with the knowledge of the will of God that your own self-will, your own human understanding has no place anymore. It's like this, that you are so saturated with the knowledge of the will of God that the opinions of society will not matter to you at all. What which means that you are so dominated and controlled for the knowledge of the will of God. The result of that dominating truth, the result of that truth saturating you and controlling you, is that number one, you'll be walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That's in verse 10. Number two, you'll be fruitful in every good work. Number three, you'll be increasing in the knowledge of God. Number four, you'll be strengthened with all might according to the glorious power of God. Number five, you'll be having patience and long suffering with joyfulness. This is telling us that everything in the believer's behavior must be regulated or related to revealed truth. There must be absolutes before there can be right behavior. That means if there were no law, if there were no absolute, if there were no rule, if there were no regulation or revelation from above, how will you know how to behave? If you behave one way or the other, how will you know whether it is right or wrong? The first thing, therefore, in the believer's life is to learn the absolutes, to learn the standard of the Word of God. That is why Bible study is so important. You wonder for the people that say they are Christians, 
and they never really study the Bible. You wonder for the people that say they want to live lives that are pleasing unto God, and they never go deep into the Word of God and study for themselves, or study with the people that know better than they do know. How will you know whether your action is right or wrong if there is nothing to measure that action? How will you know whether a decision is right or wrong if there is no index, if there is no charge, if there is nothing to regulate that decision with? How will you know, well, will you know whether some thoughts or plans are right or wrong if there is no absolute? It is when you know the word of God that you have the basis for the standard of the requirement of God. Now, first, you know it. Second, you apply and act appropriately. That's what you will find in the whole Word of God. We're not given the Word of God just to know. We're given the Word of God, number one, to know, and then number two, to apply that Word of God and walk thereby. Look at James chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore, laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive the, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Verse 21 says, receive the word with meekness. The engrafted word that saves the soul. What will be the consequence after knowing the truth? Verse 22, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. First step, know the word. Second step, do it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine, and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Have you noticed in verse 24? First, hear the word. Two, do it. He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. You see, we study the word of God so that we'll be able to have spiritual wisdom and understanding and make an application of the word of God into our lives. Hear the word, that's the first step. Second step, do it. In Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 36 and 37. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. The Lord that taught this man the truth of the kingdom of God, the truth concerning love. And the Lord wanted to know whether he had learned something, whether he knew something. He asked him a question. And from the reply to the question of Jesus Christ, the man has heard, he has learned something. That's the first step. What's the second step? Do it. Jesus then said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. We study the word of God. That's the first step. The second step, after knowing what you know, do something. In relation to that word, to regulate your life by the word of God. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye trespassed, or movable, always abandoned in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here Paul the Apostle is saying something. He said, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Knowing that, you have to do something. What are you going to do as a result of knowing that your labor is not in vain? What you have to do is be steadfast, be unmovable, always abandon in the work of the Lord. Let your conviction match your knowledge. And let your knowledge spring, spring out practice in your life. You know something, then you are going to act according to the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The New Testament, the whole Bible, 
never allows us to have just understanding of the word of God without appropriately doing something about that knowledge. It says, you have the promises of God. You know the faithfulness of God. You have the knowledge that this is what God requires. And this is the promise he has given to you. Having that knowledge, what are you going to do now? You cleanse yourselves from all filthiness. Let us look at 2 First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Paul the Apostle said, Christians, you know something. What you know is that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Don't just have the knowledge, do something about it. Verse 6, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You see, knowledge always leads to action. Your actions are always regulated by the knowledge that you have. And the first step is you know it. That is not the only step. Some people just know the word of God and that is all. And there is nothing that follows after that knowledge. It says the first step is always know it. The second step is always do something about it. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. That's knowledge. We perceive, we know the love of God. What are we going to do about that? Verse 16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Always like that in the Bible. You know something, and then you act appropriately. Let's not go to Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. For this cause... We also since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to de desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. That ye might be filled, saturated, dominated, controlled by the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What will be the result of that? Because it's just praying for them that they will have knowledge. Be saturated with knowledge. Be dominated with knowledge. And be controlled by the knowledge of the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It says, when you have knowledge, you are going to apply the knowledge and you are going to act appropriately. And it gives us in verses 10 and 11 the results, five of them, the results of dominating truth. Number one, worthy, pleasing work. Number two, fruitfulness in every good work. Number three, spiritual growth. Number four, sustaining strength through his glorious power. Number five, endurance with joyfulness. It says if you want to see a man that is filled with the knowledge of the will of God, look for these five things in his life. It says if you do not find these five things in that person's life, the person has not really learned. The person has not really received and be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It says when we are filled and saturated and dominated with the knowledge of the will of God, naturally and consequentially, these are the five things that will come up in our lives. Let's look at them one by one. Number one, walking worthy of God unto all pleasing. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Number one, we need to realize this. Without the word of God filling us, saturating us, controlling us, we can never walk worthy. Because what you think will be pleasing to God may not be pleasing to God. The darkened mind, the natural mind, the human mind will never know what will be pleasing to God except by revelation. And it is only the revelation of the will of God, the word of God, that will show us what is pleasing unto God. The Christian who does not read the Bible, study the Bible, who is not filled with the knowledge of the word of God, will never be able to please the Lord. He may have strength, he will use his strength in the wrong direction. He may have ability. He will use it in the wrong direction. 
He may have some natural wisdom. He will apply it in the wrong direction. He may have some dedications and some decisions and some consecration. He will consecrate for the wrong purpose. The only way you can walk pleasing unto the Lord is to stop all activity and learn the will of God, the knowledge of the will of God first. And then knowing that will of God, you'll be able to live and walk unto all pleasing the Lord. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verses, five, verses 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. It tells us we must receive Jesus Christ as Lord first. We must be born again first. The unbeliever is dead spiritually. He cannot walk. He doesn't have the light. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the grace. The unbeliever, the sinner, is blind spiritually. He cannot see the narrow way, and he cannot keep to the narrow way. The unbeliever, the sinner, is lame and weak, and he will be wobbling. He will not be able to walk, and there, is, there are no crutches or sticks that human religion can give him that he can walk uprightly. Before you can walk worthy of the Lord, you need to know the Lord. You need to receive the Lord. You need to be born again. When you are born again, he comes to live on the inside of you, and then you'll be able to walk in him. Outside of him, outside of his grace, you'll not be able to walk worthy. But seven, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanks given. After we know the Lord, we walk worthy of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. First, you are called. Except you are called out of the world. You cannot live different from the world. Except you are called into the kingdom of his dear son. You cannot walk according to the regulations and the rules in the kingdom of God. But first, you are called. You are converted. You become a child of God. Then you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. How do you walk worthy? Look at verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering for bearing one another in love. If there is no lowliness, you are not walking according to the vocation wherewith ye are called. If there is no humility and meekness, you are not walking right. If you cannot endure, if there is no long suffering, if you cannot forbear misunderstanding with other people and bear it patiently, you are not walking uprightly. We hear of people that say they are Christians. Loneliness, they don't have. Meekness and humility, they don't possess. Long suffering and patience, they are strangers to age. For bearing other people and trying to overlook uh, some little, little differences and walk in love, they have never tasted it. They don't know the Lord. When you are filled with the knowledge of the will of God, you'll be walking worthy in lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, patience, and forbearing one another in love. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. First, you receive the gospel, because that is the absolute. That is the standard. You will not know how to behave except you hear the gospel, receive the gospel. After receiving the gospel, let your manner of life, let your lifestyle, let your conversation, let your conduct and behavior be as it befits the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears, I may hear of your conduct, your behavior, your dealings with other people, I may hear of your lifestyle, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It says, whether the apostle Paul is with you or not, whether your preacher, your teacher is with you or not, whether the pastor is there or not, you are filled with the knowledge of the gospel of God, you are filled and saturated and controlled and dominated by the word of his will, 
live like it. Live like you know the law. Live like you have conviction. Live like you match your conviction with your knowledge, your practice with your conviction. And then we're told in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. That's a model right there, a perfect example right there. If we say we know the Lord, if we say we know the word of the Lord, if we are filled with the knowledge of his will, Jesus Christ is the express perfect personification of the total revealed will of God. And if we say we know that will, look at Jesus Christ is the will of God. Look at Jesus Christ is the model, the picture, the example of the totality of the will of God. Model your life after him and you'll be walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Let's come back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. It said that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And a false consequence of being filled and controlled but the revealed truth will be that ye walk worthy unto all pleasing, walking worthy of the Lord. Number two, that you'll be fruitful in every good work. Here Paul the Apostle tells us that the way you know that the work is doing something in this person's life is that the word is bearing fruit. And what kind of fruit will that be? A lot of fruits. And a lot of things that the word of God says about our bearing fruit. Let me show you to start with that the Christian, the child of God, is likened unto the tree that is planted by the riverside, that is bearing fruit, fruit of righteousness every time. And the more he learns of God's truth, the more fruits he'll be bearing, fruits of good deeds. And we bear fruits also of leading people to the Lord. Psalm 1, Psalm 1, from verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in, this, in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Here he tells us a man who has been taken away out of the counsel of the ungodly. And the ungodly has his counsel coming through in many ways. Ungodly man will give his counsel through the radio. Ungodly man will give his counsel of what he thinks you ought to enjoy, of the way he thinks you ought to live, of the way he thinks you ought to dress, of what he thinks you ought to be drinking. He'll give it through television. And the ungodly man will give his counsel also in the society of tribal people. He'll gather the people together, and in that community and society, they will be giving some advice and some counsel of what they think they ought, you ought to do. It says, the blessed man has been taken out of that society that is following after the counsel of the ungodly. And that he does not stand in the way of sinners. He lives a separated life. He doesn't do the things that the people of the world are doing. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of God. Of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night. You see, that is being filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, he wakes up in the morning, he never can think or dream of going out without reading the Bible. Do you know there are people who say they are Christians? Do you say there are people who tell us they are born again? Do you know there are people who say that they are following the Lord and they never really study and read the Bible in the morning when they wake up? Do you know there are people like that? Do you know there are people that will come back in the evening and what they will be going for immediately will be their television and they don't want to miss a particular program on the television and in the night they cannot read the word of God and meditate upon the word of God. They say they are Christians. The Bible says it's not for they are Christians. You know what who Christians are? Verse 2. It's delight is in the law of God. He wakes up in the morning, he delights in the word of God. He, before he goes to bed at night, he delights in the word of God. 
Do you know there are churches where they do not give the word of God real, the real center, the time that it deserves? And they will just, they will pray, they will sing, they will dance, they will do a lot of things, but no Bible study. They will do a lot of things, but they are not going to go deep into the study of the word of God. But you know, a real Christian church, its delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night, but three, it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Some Christians are like trees planted in the desert. No water, no nourishment, no teaching, no doctrine. And you can tell their lives, they are dry, they are shallow. There's no spiritual beauty, the beauty of holiness. All the leaves are dry and dropped on the ground. And you will find that these kinds of people, when they talk, there is no unction. When they talk, there is no life. You will see that deep within them, in the roots, their roots are not able to get sap. They are not able to get nourishment. Any little wind that blows will blow that dry tree down. Any fire that is kindled will burn that tree up. Don't you know there are people who say they are Christians? Any little false doctrine that comes, it blows them down like the wind. Any fire of affliction or persecution or opposition will burn them. You cannot find them on their seat anymore. You cannot find them in the church anymore. But thank God for trees that are planted by the rivers of water. They bring forth the fruit in the season. The leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Those are the people that are bearing fruit. They are bearing fruit because... They are saturated with the word of God. They are bearing fruit because they have the word of God. They know the word of God. They are filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, the result is they bear fruit. In John chapter 15, verse 15. John chapter 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. These disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were filled with the knowledge of his will. What is the result of being filled with the knowledge of his will? Verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Verse 15, they were filled with the knowledge of his will. Verse 16, they were filled with the knowledge so that they can bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Galatians chapter 5. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Think about it this way. Somebody comes to the Bible study and he learns the Bible study, learns the Word of God, but then he did not have time for the Word to sink in, for him to be filled with the knowledge of his will. He has heard the Word immediately after hearing the Word without much prayer, to make the word of God sink in, he goes to the house. Get into the house, the wife does something that he did not appreciate. He gets angry immediately. No fruit of love, of joy, of peace. What do you say about him? Truly he attends Bible study, but he is not filled with the knowledge of the will of God. You take a person that says he studies the Bible, and he has come, he has learned the word of God. He goes back home, and getting back home, then he meets the old girlfriend. And the old girlfriend, uh, you know, begins to play the old trick. Eventually, the fellow went into sin. You know what? That fellow did not have the word of God feeling his heart. You see, when the word of God saturates you and controls you, it controls your action. Because that is the benefit of the word of God. You find that there are some people that will say they are preaching the word of God, or they are learning the word of God, and they still get angry. 
And these people will still backbite and gossip. And these people will still have wrong ideas and wrong opinions and wrong thoughts against other people, criticize and cut other people down. And these people are morose, never joyful, never happy, little problem. You won't find song on their lips. You won't find joy on their face. Where is the evidence of the Bible study? Where is the evidence of studying the Word? When you are filled with the knowledge of His will, it will bring forth fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and also there will be goodness and faith. You know what that faith means? It's talking about confidence we have in one another. Some people never have confidence in anybody. The wife goes to the market, and because of the delay in transportation, instead of spending one hour, the wife has spent about two hours and he begins to think, I know that woman, she has gone to be with the old boyfriend. I know that woman, she has gone to... No faith, no confidence, no trust in anybody. You know where there is no confidence and trust? The woman will say, I study Bible, I study Bible, I cannot do without the Bible. My Bible and I were going together. And then the husband may go out of the house to go and do something then she will be checking for the pockets and the drawers and everywhere, looking, maybe the man has some letters being written by some women outside. No confidence in one another. You see, when you study the Word of God, and the Word of God has filled you and saturated you, it will control your action. It will control everything you do. You'll be bearing fruit. There will be love. There will be joy. There will be peace. You see why we have them, um, house fellowship, the reason we have our fellowship is this. We say, you come on Sunday to the service, we'll teach you the word of God. You come on Monday, we will teach you the word of God. You come on, um, on Thursday, we will teach you the word of God. And when we're always pouring water into that bucket, pouring water into that bucket, if you pour water into that bucket three times a week, we think that bucket should be filled with that good water. Go back home and go and show that you are filled with the knowledge of his will. You come on Monday, you come on Thursday, you come on Sunday, you are filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Now go and show it in the house fellowship, that you are filled with the knowledge of the word of God. How do I show it? Love. What do we find? We still find backbiting and gossiping and tearing apart and pushing away one another. Where is the evidence you are filled with the knowledge of his will? Because if you are filled with the knowledge of his will, you will be bearing the fruit of love in that house fellowship. What do you find in the house fellowship sometimes? Fighting and criticism and knocking one another. Nobody is joyful there. How about peace? Is there peace where we are suspecting everybody that one is a witch and that one is that and that one is that and talking against one another? Where is the long suffering? I cannot attend that house fellowship anymore. If that man or if that woman is the one leading that house fellowship, count me out. I'm never going to go there. And if you make me house fellowship leader in that community, take it away from me. I will never participate. My friend, where is the long suffering? You say you are studying the word of God. Where is the evidence you are filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you will be bearing the fruit of long suffering patience you'll be enduring forbearing with one another there will be gentleness and goodness and faith there will be meekness there will be self-control there will be temperance and it says against such there is no law let's go back to colossians chapter one and let us see the third evidence or the third result of being filled with the knowledge of his will it is the latter part of verse 10 and increasing in the knowledge of god and increasing in the knowledge of God. Think about it this way. Let us take uh, the tabernacle of the Old Testament people to illustrate, just for illustration. You, are, you have the outer court of the tabernacle of the children of Israel. When you get into that place, after that you have the holy place. You are not getting into the inner part of the sanctuary. When you get into, into the place further, you get to the holy of holies. Now let's take uh, somebody. Now when you're still outside, outside that tabernacle, all you will see is the badger skin. You're outside, you have not even entered the inner court. 
you have not entered the place where the lava of the washing is by the priest. You have never entered that place. You are outside. You will never see any beauty. You will never see any glory. All you will see will be the badger's skin. Then you come into the place. That is the first place where your sins can be washed. Where those priests will wash their hands and wash their feet. You come to the place where you have the sacrifice. Now you can see a little, a little of God. If that is all you have ever got, forgiveness of sin, salvation, the peace of God, your name in the book of life, the blood of Jesus washing you and serving you, if that is all you ever get, you don't know God in all. When you are saved, you know God, but you don't know him in all. You come in now and you get to the holy place. And you see the table of the showbread. When you get to that second apartment, then you know God more. You are increasing in the knowledge of God. You are increasing the knowledge of the provision of God. But even after you are sanctified, you have not still known God all through in all. When you have been sanctified, the Adamic nature is taken away. Then your heart is made like an altar unto God. And the bread of life, the show bread, is always there. God is always giving you insight in the word of God. Because the Adamic nature has been taken away, your heart has been cleansed and purified. But you, you still need to increase. Then you go into the holy of holies. Before the New Testament dispensation, before that uh, curtain was rent into two, only the high priest could get in there before the pour outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Only a few people in the Old Testament could have the power, the anointing, the endowment, the enclosing of the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. But now that curtain, that veil had been rent in two to know God and know him more, you enter now into the Holy of Holies. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then he pours out the Spirit upon you. The third person of the Trinity comes to dwell inside you. He begins to talk to you. He begins to explain scriptures to you. You, you sleep when you wake up like this. You wake up with a song. You wake up with a promise. You wake up with a Bible verse. As you, as you begin to pray like this, he begins to show you things of heaven to pray about. The things you didn't think you'll pray about before, you begin to pray about somebody in trouble. You begin to pray about somebody that you didn't know what is happening to them. You are knowing God more. When you open the word of God like this, the light from above will shine on a single verse of scripture. And then he'll be reminding you of the connection between Colossians and Ephesians. He'll be reminding you of the connection between the Ephesians and the Psalms. Reminding you of the connection between the New Testament and the Old Testament. You are knowing God more. And even after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then the Holy Ghost will take your hand and say, When you were saved, you think you knew God. When you were sanctified, you, you thought you knew God. When you, now that you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, come, let me show you who Christ is. Then he begins to reveal Christ to you. You begin to see the beauty of Christ. Then he begins to remind you of things that Jesus said before he left. He begins to show you the things to come. You see, it is these experiences that help us step by step to know God, know God more, know God more, know God more. And how do we increase in the knowledge of God? It is being filled with the knowledge of his will. It is that that will lead us to what we call spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see where we are going? You see the desire of the believer? It is not enough to say, I am saved, move on. I am sanctified, there's still more, move on. I am now baptized in the Holy Ghost, then there is still a wide field of the knowledge of God in, in front of you. Move on until you come to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As a fault you will find among a lot of Christians. You know the fault? Before salvation, they are serious. They are looking at the promises of God. They are praying unto God. 
Oh God, I want to be born again. Oh God, I want to see you. Oh God, I want to have Christ. Oh God, I want to be a child of God. Write my name in the book of life. Then they become saved. Some of them, the majority of people will stop there in many evangelical denominations. Yet they have not come to the measure or the stature of the fullness of Christ. But some people here, they know there is more after salvation. They begin to consecrate. They begin to say, oh Lord, the kind of life of Joseph, the kind of life of Samuel, the kind of life of Enoch, the kind of life of Daniel, the kind of love of, or the love of John the Beloved. Well, above it all, the mind of Christ. I want it in me. I want this Adamic nature. These thoughts that are not according to the will of God, I want everything uprooted. I want the mind of Christ. I want the love of Christ. I want the very image of the Son of God to be in me, that I'll be conformed totally to the image of Christ. And he lays everything upon the altar. He consecrates everything. The fire from above will come down, sanctify him. Some people will stop there. But those who are wise will be growing. The more you hear the word of God, the more you see the preaching of the word of God, the more you see the provisions of the word of God for us, being filled with the knowledge of his will, you will know that he doesn't want to, you to remain powerless and prayerless. And the only way, the power of God, the, that your heart can become an altar of prayer that is always burning. You see, in the Old Testament, the fire upon the altar was never to be put out. And strange fire was never to come there. And once the fire had been dropped there from above, that fire was supposed to be burning and burning and burning until the glorious day. If you remember the, in, uh, the Chronicles, when, the, when Solomon had built all the temple and the people came there to worship God and to praise the name of the Lord, when they were sounding the trumpet and they were praising the name of the Lord as one man, then the whole place was filled with the glory of God. And it was like a great smoke. And the people could not continue all the things they were doing. Heaven took over from them. That's being baptized in the Holy Ghost. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost like that, the fire will be upon the altar of your heart, burning to the Lord and burning to the Lord and burning to the Lord. Right at that time, if you will enter into the study of the Bible at that time, if you will enter into the ministry of prayer at that time, if you will enter into the ministry of helping other people and preaching to other people and praying for other people at that time, God can easily turn you to become a preacher, turn you to become an evangelist, turn you to become a pastor, turn you to become a teacher of the word of God. Who knows they can even make you an apostle. But you know, some people at that time, once they are baptized in the Holy Ghost, ah, they say, thank God. I've been looking for it a long time. Now I've got it. Now I can rest. Because I don't have to make any effort now to increase. They do not know that even after they are baptized in the Holy Ghost, there's still something they need to grow into. So the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know what will do that? It is being filled and saturated, controlled and dominated by the knowledge of his will that will give you the increase in the knowledge of God. Number four, the sustaining strength through his glorious power. Chronicles, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 1 verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. If we have time, you should analyze that part I've read to you now and take the word one by one. To start with, strengthened. You see, the natural man is weak. There are informations over here, it will weaken your hand. It will weaken your heart. There are things you will know about your community that will weaken your consecration. That will weaken your decisions. There are things that will come around and when you know about them, it will weaken your prayer life. But it says... When you are filled with the knowledge of his will, there's something it will do for you. It will strengthen you. You see, that is why we study the Bible. And if you will bear me witness, maybe you are weak at home. Maybe they gave you some information at home that weakened you, weakened your prayer life, weakened your dedication, weakened your consecration. When you come to the Bible study and you begin to hear of the word of God, his promises, his purposes, his plans in your life. 
and the things he's preparing for you. And you begin to see all the people that went through much of what you are going through now. What do you get before the end of the Bible study? You begin to be strengthened. Little by little by little, you are being strengthened and strengthened. Then it says, strengthened with might. Strengthened with might. He puts that might and that power underneath you to support you, to sustain you, to strengthen you. Then it says, strengthened with all might. That means, when you really study the word of God, you'll be so strong that there is nothing that can overcome you. Because the greater the problem, the greater the power and the might that is strengthening you and supporting you. The greater the heat of the day, the greater will be the might and the power that the Lord is supplying to be able to strengthen you. And then it says, according to his glorious power. According to his power from glory. According to his heavenly power. You see, when you study the word of God and you are saturated and controlled by the word of God, you will be so controlled, you will be so dominated by that word that nothing will actually weaken you. You will be strong. And you will be able to do everything you ought to do for the kingdom, for the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Some things had been happening that became like thorn in the flesh for Paul the Apostle. And there were things that could have weakened even a Christian, even a preacher. He went through a lot. And when he went through all these things, he went to the Lord. Hear what the Lord told him. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, it is not the persecution that is the problem. It is that you do not get the strengthening power and might of God. That's the problem. The persecution does not really matter. It is not that people are criticizing you and, uh, you know, the people are murmuring against you. That is no problem. It is, that's not what is causing this terrible discouragement and depression. Somebody will say, I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. If you know what people are saying about me, I don't have any courage to do anything for God anymore. I'm weak. They have weakened me because, of, you know, they criticize me and I'm discouraged now and I'm depressed now. It is not the criticism that is a problem. It's the fact that you are not filled with the knowledge of his will. That's a problem. Because if you are filled with the knowledge of his will, you'll be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Some people will say, I wanted to work for God. I wanted to evangelize. But if you know the trouble I have in my place of work, if you know the depression I, I get from my place of work, no promotion, no progress, nothing at all. And I'm so discouraged and depressed. And I don't have any strength to be able to move on in my Christian life. That's not the problem. The problem is that you are not filling yourself with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Because if you did, you will be strengthened with all might. According to his glorious power. You see, Paul the Apostle, he saw more than you can see. He tasted more than you can ever taste. And he said... God told me, my grace is sufficient for you. Then he said, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what we need. No wonder. Look at what he said in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you preach among the barbarians when they're likely to stone you? I can. How? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A night in the deep, and you know the peril of the way, and the peril of the false brethren, and the criticism of people that do not actually have the fullness of God in them. Can you endure it? Yes, I can. How can? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. What if God brings prosperity your way? 
and you begin to abound. Some people cannot stand that. If money comes their way, they'll forget the Bible. Can you receive money and prosperity and wealth and riches and have all the things of this world and still remain at the same level of consecration you were before? I can't. How can you do that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul, if you have not been married, and the, the, an unmarried man may have some kinds of loneliness and some problems, can you still be working for God in that situation of not getting married? Yes, I can. How can? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What if you get married and you're now having children? And children, one is sick, the other one is crying, the other one you need to pay school fees. Can you still be working for God with all the problems of those children in the family? Paul, suppose you are a married man. Can you still do all things you ought to do for Christ? Yes, I can. How can? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. What if some people are willing you? They are waiting on the way for you and they are saying, we are going to kill that man. If we don't kill him, we are not going to sleep. Can you still walk through that way and walk for God? Yes, I can. How can you? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What if there is no food and you have to go on compulsory fasting? Will you still be walking for God and preaching the gospel, Paul the Apostle? Yes, I will. And I can. How will you do that? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. There is no journey that is so long that you cannot go through if you get the strength of Christ. There is no mountain that is too high that you cannot climb if you have the strength of Christ. There is no fire that is burning in your family that you cannot continue living the Christian life if you get the strength of Christ. There is nobody in the house fellowship that will constitute himself or herself a gossiper and a cheat and will be running about saying, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you. There is no lion in the house fellowship that will stop you from leading house fellowship if you are strengthened with Christ. And there is no unfavorable condition in the church or in the house fellowship or in the district or in the zone that will stop you from being useful to God if you are strengthened by Christ. The problem with many people is that they are not strengthened. They are not strengthened. They are so weak. They cannot pray. And they do not make any effort to be strengthened. But when you are strengthened by the Lord, then you will be able to testify like Paul the Apostle. Whatever is happening, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I believe and I pray that that will be our experience in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Don't think about your problems. Be strong in the Lord. Don't have self-pity, self-consideration, then crying and weeping, discouraged, and not rise up and praise the name of the Lord. I never come up here on Thursday and give testimony. And it's all the time bent low, bowed down, crying, shedding tears. You don't know what I'm going through. Sometimes on the mountains, something in, sometimes in the deep. Finally, my brethren, let's forget all those things and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 13. Wherefore take unto you. The whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Thank God, no matter how the day is evil, we shall be able to stand. And having done all to stand, stand your ground. Stand therefore, having let your loins gathered about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith whereby we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's now go to the last thing, number five, endurance with joyfulness. Endurance with joyfulness. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11. With all patience. 
and long suffering with joyfulness. I want you to think about the people that start a Christian race and they are not able to finish. You know the problem? Because of the lack of patience, because of the lack of long suffering, they are not able to finish. I want you to think about the people that start praying for something and then they give up. They cannot pray anymore because of delay. You know why? Lack of patience, lack of long suffering. I want you to think now in your mind, the people that started the house fellowship together with you, they're still coming to church, but they don't step out to fellowship anymore. They don't go to house fellowship anymore. You know why? Lack of patience, lack of long suffering. I want you to think of the people in the early parts of their Christian life. They used to help people, cheerful believers, cheerful believers. Anywhere they go, anytime you see them, always cheerful. They encourage people, they lift up people, they pray for people. Always smiling, always happy, always joyful. Not that there were no persecutions and problems at that time, but now they're gloomy. They cannot cheer up anybody anymore. They cannot encourage anyone anymore. You know why? Lack of patience. Lack of long suffering. I want you to think of people, when they started this Christian race, they came into the church, almost everybody was their friend. Ah, brother, brother, sister, sister, how are you there? What am I going to eat there? Give me something there. Let's, you know, we are Christians. I don't have a 50 cover. Give me one naira there. Cheerful people, cheerful people. But now they don't talk to anybody. They come in quietly and they go out sluggishly. They don't know anybody as friend anymore. All their friends, the people that are still trying to be friendly and say, ah, brother, how are you? The way they will answer, they don't want you to be their friend. They don't want you to talk to them. You know why? Some people have disappointed them and they don't have long suffering. The result of being filled with the knowledge of the will of God is that you have all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Whatever is happening, Whatever the suffering, whatever the persecution, whatever all the lies people are telling against you, whatever the misunderstanding, whatever the littleness and the immaturity of the people in the house fellowship, always joyful. You tell lies against them, they say they lied against Jesus too. And you misunderstand them, they misunderstood the words of Jesus too. And you push them, they say, that praise the Lord that is testing my faith. And when my faith has been tested, I will come out pure like gold. Those are the people, they are being saturated and controlled with the word of God. Anywhere they go, they have patience. Anywhere they go, they forbear with one another. Anywhere they go, they have long suffering with joyfulness. I believe we need to pray today that all the things we have lost, all the things we have kicked away from our lives, we'll be able to have them back in Jesus' name. As you have been coming here for the Bible study, and you are being filled with the knowledge of the will of God, are you walking to all pleasing? Are you being fruitful in every good work? Are you growing spiritually? Have you been saved? Have you been sanctified? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? If you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, are you still on the altar of the Lord and praying and consecrating everything to the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, I'm not satisfied yet. I want to know God more. I want to know God more. I want to have your power. I want to know your purpose. I want to know the plan of my, for, your, for my life from you. I want to know it more. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, yet I want more revelation of Jesus Christ. More revelation and death of the knowledge of the Word of God. Are you growing spiritually? Is the power of the Lord sustaining you? The glorious power from above, is it coming upon you and sustaining you? Are you enduring? Are you enduring? Are you forbearing? Are you patient with your fellow brother, with your fellow sister? Or are we now just gloomy, no courage, no power anymore? Can you endure? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. You endure with joyfulness. You endure with joyfulness. You endure, you forbear with joyfulness. There will be patience, there will be long suffering in your life. And you will endure the Christian ways, the Christian life, and the problems of the joy of the Lord be your strength every time.